Coming up on Car Advice, Hyundai extends the i30 range with a souped up N-Line. Puncture-free tyre technology. Steve Price joins the panel to take a look at an innovative tyre invention. And the fire-breathing Dodge Challenger will record Mustang sales entice Dodge to send it down under. Welcome to Car Advice. We've got another big show in store for you this evening. Plenty to look at in the world of automotive. Firstly, the sensational new Hyundai i30 N-Line. So not the N, the N-Line. We'll take a look at the warm hot hatch, almost hot, kind of warm in the Hyundai stable. Our mate Steve Price returns to tell us about an amazing tyre innovation, really interesting this, which could spell the end of flat tyres for good, and the tyre shredding Dodge Challenger. Will Dodge finally tap into Australia's love of American muscle cars. It'd be great if they did. Joining me to talk all things automotive, Car Advice Senior Road Tester, Paul Marrick. Good evening. End of flat tyres. End of flat tyres. That'd be nice, wouldn't I like it? like the sound of that. I haven't changed one for a while. I've got an assistant to do that. Just <laughs> fix that tyre for me. First up, let's take a look at something, though, that I don't know whether our viewers are going to be into this or not. BMW have released pricing and specifications for two new variants of X3 and X4. So we've got a million... SUVs in Australia already. Yep. They're everywhere. These are variants of variants, aren't they? That's right. So we don't have pricing just yet, but we do have specs on yep. these. So you've got X4 on they the left, good. X3 on the right. Now, both of them are going to be available as M and M competition. <laughs> now, they've actually done a pretty good job here yep. with the engine offering. So 353 kilowatts of power out of just the standard M, and it jumps up to 375. This is a really good engine because what they've done as well is put an all-wheel drive system in that's similar to the one used in the M5, which means you'll be able to do some drifty things and, and a whole stack of fun <laughs> in stuff. In an SUV. Yeah, it's well, this cool. Is the, this is the thing. It's kind of cool in one sense, but then in the other, if you've driven a competition variant of a yep. BMW M car, and you know, for viewers who don't know what they are, they're pretty hardcore, hard-edged performance yep. vehicles. The question is whether we need them in an SUV. That's what we need to try to get to the bottom. You know what? This is literally just a response to Mercedes-Benz with the GLC. Yeah, I am so though. GLC have uh, the 43, mm. they've got the 63S. Zero to 104.1 seconds for quick. the comp. That's 4. fast. 4.2 seconds for the standard that one. That is so fast, yeah. It is quick. Spent a lot of time lately talking about local manufacturing, local distribution, and our viewers will know all about the Holden Ford Toyota situation. However, this is a big story. It's a big story for Australia, uh, and it's only come to light recently, and it's about the fact that GM, so General Motors, the parent company, is considering a proposal to shut the Holden office in Australia altogether. So they've already stopped manufacturing. Mm. This would shut the office altogether and switch to an independent importer. Now, there's a whole bunch of ramifications. We'll get to that with Opel in a second. This is a big deal for Australia. If this happens, it really signals the end for Holden as we know it, doesn't it? That's right. And if you look at GM globally, GM has shut down a whole bunch of factories around the world. And the fact that they've kept Holden as its own brand is a bit of a surprise because we're not manufacturing cars here anymore. So having a Holden umbrella is weird. Mm -hmm. um, what it would mean though is a whole bunch of back office advantages. So Inchcape, who currently imports Subaru, Peugeot and Citroen, they're the company and importer looking to bring Holden, I guess, mm. into Australia. Yeah. And that would also mean that we could see rebranding of cars. But for you as a customer, the dealership experience wouldn't change at all. The reason they're eyeing this off, a lot of people think Holden's in dire straits and they're, they're really about to sink. But last year, Holden posted a profit of $150 million. Mm. And the year before, 125. So it is technically it's growing. Not bad. Um, so, not bad. I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating move. And then if you move past that to the uh, Opal situation, there's the potential that the Opal brand could return to Australia yep. as well. I guess the bigger picture implication of this is if you're bringing in vehicles that have nothing to do with Holden in the first place, exactly. why do you keep the Holden name going? Yep. Do you just bring them in as Opals or Vauxhalls or Chevrolets or whatever they happen yep. to be around the world? I guess another point that's worth making is that American manufacturers outside of Mustang with the, with the Ford product, they're not really succeeding globally, are they, American manufacturers? They're not selling Strange. you know, bucket loads of cars yeah. in other markets outside the States. It's, it's so weird because you think of the American cars and mm. a lot of people just think muscle cars. Yeah. They don't actually think about the rest of the products that are available. We also want to know what it means for Holden's engineering operations yeah. and the design yeah. studio. Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know whether you would buy a European or American car rebadged as a Holden. <laughs>
So the end of February, it's the time when we start to take a look back at the first month and the VFACT new car sales data. Uh, for me, 2019 is going to be a really interesting year in Australia because I think the market has got a bit of pressure on it. Now, we noticed if we look at VFACTs, all luxury car brands in Australia except Lexus were down effectively. Now, some of them, it's, it's a big deal. Now, some of them, Rolls-Royce sold one car in January 19 against none in That's January 2018. A big, oh, a big, massive increase. 100% increase. Uh, I think Bentley sold 13 against 12. But in reality, all the luxury car manufacturers down except Lexus. However, it's not all bad news because in amongst all of that, MG yep. surprised us all at Car Advice by going up and going up a long way. The Chinese have purchased the MG brand name. And this is a smart move because previously we look at people purchasing brand names and, and just think it's, it's a bit yeah, of a waste yeah, of time. Exactly. But now when you go past an MG dealership, you get flashbacks and memories of these small sports cars and you think, I could see myself mm. in an MG again. Absolutely. And there's a reason behind that. 503 units sold just in January. Yeah. And that means they outsold Land Rover, Volvo, Skoda, Jeep, Mini. It is an incredible feat. If I can just stop you there for a second. So the 503 cars up tenfold over January 18. So yeah. that's massive. That's huge for starters. But then secondly, outselling brands like Land Rover, Volvo and Skoda. You know, think of how many Skodas you see on the road in Australia, yeah. how much Land Rover product you see on the road in Australia. MG outsold those brands. And I think in addition to a whole bunch of things, obviously the Chinese are doing this really well now. We've mm. seen them do it really well with Lotus. Yep. Uh, they've done a great job there. They're obviously doing a good job with MG. This to me shows that even though we joke about MG building sports cars, yep. clearly in 2019, in Australia specifically, you need to be building SUVs to be selling that volume, don't you? Absolutely. And this is the car that's the star for them. It's called yeah. the ZS. Yep. It's a CX-3 competitor. It's well-priced. It's safe. Seven-year warranty. I mean, you really can't go wrong yeah. with it. So. Interested to see whether they've diddled some of these numbers, whether these are all just registrations they've stuck on dealer floors. <laughs> yeah. But have you bought an MG? What do you yeah. think of it? How's it going? Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know. If you're sitting at home and you're getting a little confused by hot hatch, warm hatch, Hyundai i30, i30 N line, i30 N, <laughs> you're not alone. We're going we're gonna to try to dispel some of these confusions right here, right now. So what you're looking at there is the regular Hyundai i30. Yes. Then if you step up from that, you go to the N-Line, which yes. is what we're going to have a look at now, and that replaces SR, and then there was also an SR Premium. And then above that, there's the i30 N. Now, the N is the one that we recently said at Car Advice was the quintessential now hot hatch. Yeah. Like it dethroned the Golf GTI. It's a seriously good, seriously focused hot hatch. Now, the difference between hot and warm hatch is when you get to the car that we're looking at now. So the N line is what we'd call a warm hatch. The N is the hot hatch. Yep. So manufacturers have gone further and further and further with what traditionally has been the hot hatch segment. So Golf GTI is the perfect example of that. Now the Hyundai i30 N. The N line is for people who probably don't want something quite that focused. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you don't want outrageous popping, cracking, right. all that sort of stuff, yep. the N line's for you. And it's a clever move by Hyundai because prior to the i30N, they didn't really have a high performance product. No. So the N now signifies the pinnacle of performance. So by creating an N line, you're suggesting that you know, it's got the sporty elements, but it's not exactly a, a ball tearer. That's so right, think, exactly. So yeah. it means they can then push out the N line to things like Tucson and other, mm. other vehicles in their lineup. And th this car really is interesting to me because they've been able to give it that aggressive look of the i30N, but it doesn't have to go too hard mm. outside of that. Kicks off from 26,490 plus your on-road costs, and under the bonnet is a 1.6 litre turbocharged petrol engine. We know that engine's good because it's it was in the SR, and the SR itself was quite a capable car. But they've stepped it up a bit with Michelin Pilot uh, yeah. tires, yeah, so yeah, really you're getting tires. a really grippy tire mm. here, a really nice little package that that just looks cool as well. We'll get to the tires in a sec because we reviewed this out of our Sydney office. Kurt did the review. If you go to caradvice.com, you can have a look at the review on the website. And Kurt said that. He was really impressed with it. He came into the office one day and he said to me, I need you to take this car and go for a drive in it because I hadn't driven it at that point. And I said, and why? You're annoying him and I was I ignore him in general. Yeah, I just don't talk to him. And he said to me, I need you to take this car for a drive. And I asked him why. And he said, because I think it's really, really good. And I don't want to go too far out on the limb in case I'm, you sure. know, misreading it a little bit. So I took it for the day, did a whole bunch of different driving, city driving, found yep. some twisty roads. It is an unbelievably good car. Now, intrinsically, it's a good platform to start with. Yep. The price is incredible. 26 plus on roads is really, really good value for money. Plus the warranty that we always talk about with Hyundai. But I think 
the local suspension and handling tune coupled with those really high-end Michelin tyres. So the Michelin tyres we're talking about are one step back from um, Pilot Supersports. So I yeah. think they're Pilot Sport Cup oh, 4 yeah, or something yeah, now yeah. Uh, they're up to. So they're seriously good performance tyres, but without that compromise that you get with a Focus track tyre yeah. that's really Such good on the track and not so great in the wet, these are a really good mix of both. Uh, we've recently put them on a BMW M135i, for example, and they're fantastic yep. to step back from the more performance-oriented ones. So what this does is it allows you to access a Hyundai product that's not quite as focused as the end. And Kurt and I had the conversation that if you're, you know, not in your mid to mm. early to mid twenties and you want something that's not a real performance hatch, this yep. is the car you buy because the N is probably a little too focused for a lot of people. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's let's look at some numbers here. 150 kilowatts, 265 newton meters of torque. You can get it in a six-speed manual yep. or a seven-speed dual clutch auto. Now, there's a problem. <laughs> there is a big old. <laughs> well, problem we haven't here. tested the auto yet, but what's the other yeah, problem? So the issue is that the manual doesn't come with AEB. So you're spending $30,000 on yeah. the road and it doesn't come with AEB. Hyundai claims that they can't fit it to cars out of the plant where this car's built. Okay. <laughs> Everyone else can do <laughs> AEB on a manual. Yeah. Why can't Hyundai? Yeah. So they need to fix that urgently yeah. because it's a glaring safety omission. The other issue is the seven speed dual clutch. I just don't think it's the best gearbox in the world. Mm. So, you know, they have made some changes to it but I, I just feel like it's not quite as sharp as it could be. Well, you're going to be testing the automatic. We've only driven the manual. The actual manual gearbox itself is fantastic. Yeah, the manual's and, great. And to be honest, I think the platform probably lends itself to a manual in many exactly. ways. Yep. But I agree with you. I think the dual clutch thing, I just test drove a Kia that had a mm. dual clutch, a Rio GT. And you ask yourself, it was a good iteration of it, worked well, but you ask yourself whether it actually adds anything to the equation over a conventional torque yep. converter automatic. And I have a feeling, we'll wait to see once you've driven it, but I have a feeling that in this kind of application, where you're not looking for lightning fast yep. shifts like you would on a racetrack, yep. you may in fact be better off with a conventional automatic. Exactly. And here's the issue, right? So a dual clutch brings with it generally in a sports car launch control. Yep. So it gives the car the ability to rev up, dump a clutch and then mm. get away in a hurry. This car doesn't do that. So you, you're <laughs> immediately not getting any benefit from the dual yeah. clutch. Generally, though, your dual clutches are there for the purpose of fuel efficiency. So you're getting an 8 to 10% fuel efficiency gain. So manufacturers, they're not getting lazy, but they're kind of cheating a little bit by just going down the path of a dual clutch because you're getting better fuel economy. But you're then detracting away from the drive. I'd much prefer to see this thing with, with a nice torque converter, which is a conventional automatic transmission. I just reckon it would drive better people wouldn't really care that much about the fuel economy because yeah. you're getting a nice drive in return. Exactly, and, and if people don't understand what we're referring to with the dual clutch transmission, you get a kind of on-off feel in low speed yeah. traffic sometimes. It's a little jerky, it's not as smooth as a conventional automatic. Looking back at some more of the positives though, I think obviously we've talked about the engine power and performance, the tires, the chassis. Uh, what I really like about it is, I think this is a slightly more upmarket look than the old SR. Yeah, I absolutely. think the style of it is excellent. And we've always liked the i30 platform, the cabin space, the second row space, the luggage space, the uh, infotainment's storage, the great. infotainment's yeah. great. Uh, it's a really, really good hatchback to live with around town. And this has all of those features with a sportier driving experience. So I think, you know, for me, this is a further example and a further, you know, indication of the fact that Hyundai can build sporty cars and they can do it well. Yeah, exactly. If you are in the market for a car like this, don't go straight to it just yet, because there's <laughs> another car that's just been released, the uh, Kia Cerato GT, mm. available in a hatch and a sedan, also comes with the same dual clutch and virtually the same engine. I mean, yeah. they're, they're on the same platform. So have a look at that, because that will then come with a seven-year warranty. They're doing drive-away pricing, which undercuts this effectively at drive-away price. So... I don't know, they, they could have a bit of a challenge on their hands Absolutely, here. I love this tit for tat thing that mm, Kia and Hyundai great. do. It's great for the consumer. And speaking of which, I'd love to hear from you, advice at caradvice.com. If you're looking at a German product like a Golf, yep. would you consider a South Korean alternative like a Hyundai i30? So let us know. Paul, joining us on the panel this evening, our mate from uh, 2GB, from the Macquarie yes. Media Network, Steve Price. Hello. Lovely to be here, Trent and Paul. As usual, uh, talking at cars with you guys is such fun. We've recently had a sponsor come on board for the radio show, which is really interesting. And, and for the viewers at home that haven't heard about this technology, don't worry, we're going to be testing it at Car Advice soon because the guys are keen to get us behind the wheel of some cars fitted with these. ASV puncture-free tyres. Now, I know you've tested them. You've actually seen them in the real world. Tell us a little bit about what you know about them. ASV is a, a massive business in the western suburbs of Sydney. They actually rebirth cars. And so as <laughs> right. a side, yeah. they decided 
to input these uh, puncture-free tyres. Mm -hmm. And so they've got a gel inside the actual tyre. Mm. So as long as you don't puncture the sidewall, mm. you can ride, drive straight over bolts, nails, anything in the road, mm. and the tyre reseals. Mm. Right. And you can drive then forever. You yep. don't have to get it to repaired. Yep. You just drive until the tyres are worn out. Yeah. And the good thing about these things is they're available at every tyre shop. You don't have to go out to these right. guys. Not you go yep. to your, your tyre bloke and say, I want some of these ASV tyres. I drove over a lump of wood, no kidding, with a hundred nails in it, and then I drove over another lump of wood, two big bolts in it, yep. and and I was in a uh, Mercedes wagon, yep. uh, and then I then took it for a drive down around the block and back again. You wouldn't have known. Mm. You would not have known. That is great. So I tell you why they're interesting and important. What's one of the most dangerous things you can do? Change a tire Absolutely. on the side of a freeway. Yeah, yeah. 100%. You've got the family. You're driving down, you know, the M1 or something. Bootful. Bang! You do a tire, yep. and you pull over, mm -hmm. and you've got that much room off the side of yep. the, a laneway where there's trucks going past yep. at 100 k an hour. Yeah. So if you don't have to pull over, what an advantage that is. Well, everybody mm. panics, don't they? So they stop immediately because they don't want to do any more damage, yep. and they don't always stop in the best place to do exactly what you're saying. And the great thing the for these things is uh, people who do hundreds of kilometres, hundreds of thousands of kilometres a mm. year, yeah. service vehicles. Yeah. The yeah. Ambos, yeah. the coppers, yeah. because yep. they don't want to be sitting there with a no. punctured tyre. No. And if you've got a flat tyre, it's bad business. Yeah, absolutely. So I think these guys are, have got a really good product. Mm. And you know what? It's it's uh, a lot of people harp on about run flat tyres, yeah. but run flat tyres are, are kind of a misnomer because you get a flat, you can then only do 80 k's an hour, mm. you've then got to go get it fixed. Whereas with this technology, you can get it punctured, keep driving on it, and it's perfect for stuff like trailers. Because can yeah. you imagine a caravan? Having yeah. to jack that well, thing up and change yeah, the I just Or what would happen to you if you oh, run yeah. a, if you get a flat in a van at speed, yeah. I, you tow it, I, I yeah. don't. That, yeah. could, that can get really dangerous. Well, absolutely. I was just going to say, I had my old Chevy truck on the back of a trailer and it would have weighed 2,600 yep. with the heavy-duty trailer. If one of those tyres let go at 110 on the freeway, it's not ideal See you later, at all. Trent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that point you made then with run flats good because... We, we have people ring the radio station often, they ask if cars have got a full-size spare. Yeah. Because if you're out in country areas in Australia, mm -hmm. you don't want to be stuck with some silly little space saver that no. you can only do 80 k's an hour. So a lot of cars don't have a full-size spare, so these tyres would be even more useful for those people. And a lot of these SUVs these days, they're putting low-profile tyres on uh, them. Too, and then yeah, people exactly. are driving yeah. off-road yeah. and suddenly they've got a smashed up tyre. Yeah, that's yep. true. Absolutely. Now. One other thing that people need to consider as well when buying a new car is... Get a garage. <laughs> yeah, get a garage. <laughs> or a big umbrella. Because behind yeah. you is yeah. the consequence yeah. of a bit of hail. And I tell you what, it is becoming harder and harder these days to actually get insurance for cars with hail. And there's been a recent development there where insurers won't actually give you comprehensive insurance. Mm. Late December, big hailstorm in Sydney swept through, particularly the eastern suburbs. Yep. I know one dealer, one Mercedes dealer in Sydney, 70 demonstrator cars, Jeez. Mercedes, so you can yeah. add that up for yeah. yourselves. Oh, yeah. That's you know, a couple of million bucks worth of cars, yeah. yep. uh, hail damage, some of them write-offs, but many of them able to be repaired. Do you guys know if you can actually repair a hail damaged car if the damage is not extensive? Yeah, if it's not extensive, you can. If it's one or two dings on a panel, it can be done with suck up. spotless dent removal. Yeah, but the problem is, you know, these ones behind us or that Mercedes-Benz dealer, if the roof, the bonnet and the boot and a couple of the side panels are done, it, you can't fix a roof. A roof is no, impossible. If it's a side rail or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You can't fix it. And as you said, this summer that we've had in Sydney and to a lesser extent Melbourne, we've had some of that severe hail and they've large hailstones. They've done some real damage and you can't fix them. Yeah. But that point you were making about insuring a vehicle that you buy cheaply because it's already got hail damage, that's something that the viewers should be oh, wary of. Please be careful with that. It may seem like an awesome deal to get you know, a two-year-old Mercedes-Benz yeah. for 20 grand. Yeah. But the fact is that you can't get comprehensive insurance on a lot of these cars and it's simply because... Well, Yes, that's yes. true, except if you look around, you well, will get insurance. Yes, right. I mean, some of the big insurers are saying, no, we're not going to yep. touch it because if you then have an accident, you're going to presume that we're going to fix the whole car. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I reckon if you took photographs of the hail damage mm. and went to an insurance yep. broker yeah. and said, mate, I've got a... Uh, I've got a $120,000 E-Class Mercedes, yep. they're going to sell it to me for 90, mm. which is a great bargain. Uh, will you insure it for me if I give you a stat deck that I'm never going to claim yep. for that? I imagine you could then well, get more. Would you? I mean, obviously it doesn't really affect the performance of the car because it's just a bit of power Well, I'm damage. driving one of these hail damage yeah. cars, right? And of course it doesn't mm. affect the yeah. performance. And would yeah. you own it, one though? It, well, this car is a good, it's an E-Class convertible. Right. Grey E-Class convertible. Yeah. Uh, E300. 
Now they're a beautiful car. Stunning you look at car. you go out there and look at it. It's like a piece yeah. of sculpture. Yeah. Mm. But it's now a piece. It's like Leonardo da Vinci's statue <laughs> getting ball. with a, someone hitting it with a hammer. <laughs> yeah. And you suddenly go, oh, it doesn't look quite <laughs> yeah. as good it as it was. It was artwork <laughs> before, and not anymore. So that is the issue. Mm. Yeah. If you can blind yourself to the fact yeah. that the dents are there, but I mean, you go in. I went into the car wash the other day. Bloke goes, mate. What happened here? <laughs> what have you done to Parked this Mercedes? Golf, what course. are you doing? You're a killer. And so, you know, you suddenly feel very <laughs> inadequate that you've wrecked this beautiful machinery. So, Pricey started with a good piece of advice there and we'll finish with a good yeah. piece of advice. Get a garage. Get a garage, exactly. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, mate. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Favourite part of the show, as always, your questions and you want our answers. Makes us mm -hmm. think a little bit. That's why we like it. Now, first question relates to a Dodge Challenger. I don't even actually know what the question is, but the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely yes. What's the question? <laughs> oh, we'll go to the next one. Then. Yeah, that's um, right. No, in all seriousness, a uh, question here from Bruce. Given how well the Mustang is selling in Australia, what are the chances of the Challenger Hellcat mm. coming to Australia? Slim to none. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. With the next platform, there is rumours of right-hand drive. So obviously with the current platform, it's right near the end. It's been out forever and a day. It's kind of hard to engineer a right-hand drive in there, but for the next one, they might. You can get it converted in Australia, but I don't know. I, I see a lot of these conversions and I just wonder longevity, mm. how they would yeah. hold up, especially a performance car like this. The Hellcat is so powerful, it's missing part of a headlight so that they can get extra cooling into the car. Exactly. I mean, th that is, yeah. it, it, the Demon is like a nine second quarter mm. mile car. It's this madness, thing is yeah. ballistic. Absolutely, I mean, so, look at it, it looks tough. Oh, they're stunning so cool. cars. When you see them in the flesh, they're really cool. Yeah. We saw them at SEMA last year, mm. they're amazing. Uh, I think the question that viewers probably have, and, and this has always been the annoying thing about this platform, is it's the same as a 300C. Mm. So the 300C is right hand drive, so underneath, uh, it's already there to facilitate right-hand yep. drive, and we could have had a right-hand drive car. And obviously, the question that we've got there, the Mustang has gone ballistic yep. here in Australia. Uh, we know that um, HSV slash Walkinshaw are having real success with the Camaro. There's no doubt that this car would sell in Australia. Yep. It would go crazy here because there are a lot of Chrysler fans in Australia from as far back as the 60s, yep. and they love performance variants of the Chrysler. So it would work, and I think it would absolutely cash in on our current re-love affair almost with muscle yeah. cars. And I would be in the oh, line just as much as you would. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute monster of a car. Um, and I think it would work here in Australia. So advice at caradvice.com if you want to know anything else, obviously. But let us know if the Dodge Challenger, either the Hellcat or the Demon, the even more hardcore version of it, was available in Australia. Let us know if you'd buy one. Or if you bought one as a conversion. Exactly. Let us know what yeah. you think. Next few questions, also an interesting one, Paul, about the Range Rover brand specifically. Yes. So what have we got there? God, it confuses me, let alone this, yeah, this absolutely. Uh, viewer. So this is uh, Lawrence in Sydney. Thank you for emailing. Uh, I was looking at upgrading my Range Rover, and there's some more on the market than ever. If I want something that can run the kids around but is also exciting to drive, which one should I go for? Look, it's such a difficult one. If you've had a Range Rover and you love the product, you're going to want to stick with the product. I mean, have a yeah. look at it. It's a beautiful they looking vehicle. They are stunning. Vehicle. Unbelievable. They really are. The styling is sensational. Has been for a long time. The issue, though, is not that. I think the issue for Range Rover, Land Rover mm. products is when they're out of warranty, repairs can cost yep. an absolute bomb. Uh, and then resale value can be an issue. Now, yep. Lawrence will be experiencing that if he's trying to get rid of an old one to buy a new one. Yep. It's a tough one. And I think also, too, you've got to take into account that you've got fun to drive variants from BMW, Mercedes and Audi now in that large SUV space. So it's a really difficult decision to make, isn't it? All right, well, let's pretend that Lawrence specifically wants a Range Rover. <laughs> You've got a few options out there and one that's actually coming to Australia shortly. It's the Range Rover Velar SV Autobiography. Right. It's like the world's longest no, car name. It's silly. going to be almost $200,000, but the best bit is it comes with a supercharged five litre V8 yeah, engine. we like that. Tiny bit less power than the Range Rover SVR mm. Sport but it still looks, mm. sounds, and will be incredible to drive as well. The biggest issue, though, is the price list. You, you could literally oh, pick any options. product Crazy. at a million dollars in options. But on the servicing front, you can pre-purchase five years of servicing. It's around 1500 bucks, which is pretty good. So mm. if you do plan on holding onto the car for five years, you can prepay that servicing, get yourself an extended warranty, and then sell it when it's done. And you're laughing. Yeah, you're laughing, absolutely. And I would say, I'm not the biggest advocate of buying cars just on style, yeah. but when you see a Velar on the road, you take notice. They look beautiful, don't oh, they? Oh, yeah. You look mm. twice. They've got a lot of tech. They, they're they good cars. The only downside to the Velar, though, for example, is the interior yeah. room. The back seat has barely any room at all. So despite it looking huge on the outside, 
you've got to kind of cram people into the back there. So if you do need something bigger, the sports to go for, uh, if you do want something powerful, big, it's the big Range Rover. Absolutely. This one that you're after. Well, we've run out of time again, mate, as we always tend to do. Advice at caradvice.com if you've got any of these questions for us. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thank you, us. mate. Cheers. Thank you for joining us at home, and we'll see you again same time next week, Wednesday nights at 7.30pm on Your Money.